a podcast. What is the word? A podcast by Galugo. A podcast. No. By Galugo. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christy, and this is Today We Tried, a parenting podcast from Kalugo that's all about connection and confidence. Each week, I chat with guests who share relatable and diverse stories and offer actionable ideas and advice to help you to remember, you got this. Hi, I'm Christy, your host and co-founder and chief parent officer at Kalugo. I am so excited to be back with new episodes of Today We Tried. If you're caught up, you know that we're doing a deep dive into the fourth trimester, and we started with my story, my in-the-moment recordings and conversations with our producer, Zach, when I just had my fourth baby, Holland. We wanted to create space for real, raw conversations about the fourth trimester where nothing was held back. And believe me, nothing was held back. Our goal, to help new and expecting parents feel connected and more confident. And we're so thrilled that it resonated. We've gotten amazing feedback. Truly, thank you. We're now super excited to be sharing other perspectives on the fourth trimester from parents who have been through it and experts in this wild time. To kick things off, we have my conversation with Bennett Casper Williams, a queer, transgender, non-binary seahorse dad, activist, lawyer, and creator. We dive into so many of the themes raised in the first part of the season, partnership, feeding, mental health, bodies, getting outside. So this is the perfect place to start. Also, I'm super excited to share that Bennett is also helping Kalugo launch our Pride Compact Stroller. All sales go to support family equality and their mission to advance legal and lived equality for LGBTQ families and those who wish to form them through building community, changing hearts and minds, and driving policy change. You can find our Pride Compacts on our website, www.highcalugo.com. And now, without further ado, let's get started. I am so excited to be here today with Bennett Casper Williams. Bennett, can we just start with having you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure. Uh, My name is Bennett Casper Williams. I use he, him pronouns. I am a trans masculine non-binary person. I was assigned female at birth. So I was raised and socialized as a a girl and as a woman. And then in my early thirties, I decided to transition um, to, to At the time, male, um, but since I have transitioned, I've realized that my gender is more non-binary than female or male. And so my journey has been a really interesting one. Part of the reason why I'm here is because a part of my journey as a a trans-masculine non-binary person has been that I also um, carried a child. Uh, My son will be 19 months old uh, next week. And he is a total delight. He's amazing. But I carried him while I, you know, post transition. So I looked exactly like I do now, except I was pregnant. And it was super fun. Some of it was fun. Some of it was not fun. We will we will talk more about that. Yes. And you use the term seahorse dad. Yeah, I refer to myself as a seahorse dad. So I use he him pronouns and I call myself a dad. But my concept of my gender is more non-binary than binary. So I do apply some, some terms to myself that are male like dad, but yes. So I use the term seahorse dad, which means um, a dad who has given birth to his child or their child. And it's based on the seahorse, the animal um, in which in that species, the males of the species carry the children and then actually release them into the wild. And if you're interested, you should Google seahorse giving birth. Um, It's a very strange, you can't unsee it. (laughs) It's a very (laughs) strange and kind of magical experience to watch. Nothing like watching a transmasculine person give birth. (laughs) But yeah, you know, we take the analogy from nature because I think People, one of the arguments that transphobes always try to wield against us is that like 
being trans is somehow unnatural. And I think the seahorse is an excellent example from nature of how nature doesn't even understand or respect binaries. Like Mm -hmm. there are roles in, in nature in many species that cross binaries and that's true in humans too. One of the articles that you've done where you're talking about your pregnancy that you kind of separated the idea of gender from pregnancy and focused on how your body functions and that something your body can do is carry a child and give birth. And I think that's really powerful. And as we're thinking about being birthing people, like that language is really meaningful and to focus on what our, what our bodies can do and like not on gender. People are always trying to say that I'm like asking folks to make up like new words or new terminology. And I think it's really more about just uncoupling things that we associate that don't necessarily belong together. So it's not that I'm asking to think about it in a new way so much as like think about it really critically. Like, for example, there are other functions that you know, certain bodies can do that other bodies can't do that are totally irrespective of gender as well. Like some folks are double jointed, you know, some folks um, like Michael Phelps don't produce as much lactic acid or whatever his, you know, like there are different things that different people's bodies do that we don't attach gender to. But for some reason, hint, it's the patriarchy. We associate gender with pregnancy because it helps us tie femininity to this othering that allows for, you know, there's like, there's a lot of cultural ties to it, but it's not actually something that has to be gendered. And when I sort of started thinking of my body as like just a body and not like a man's body or a woman's body, it's just my body. When I started thinking about it that way, I was like, well, this body has the ability to carry a child. When my husband and I first got together, we weren't necessarily sure. Like we knew we wanted kids, but me having a kid wasn't 100% going to be a part of the journey. I had to really do some thinking on it to do some unlearning in that respect. Um, But I think being able to really buy into that idea and believe it fully allowed me to sort of shrug off a lot of dysphoria that I think I might have otherwise maybe had because pregnancy is so gendered. So in your partnership with Malik in this kind of exercise of thinking critically about gender and separating that from body, I'm also thinking about that in terms of what is also gendered in terms of your role as the person who is carrying the baby. And then in the fourth trimester, the role of the person who is carrying the baby versus the partner. And was that something that you guys kind of consciously thought about or kind of like what your roles were going to be and what your partnership was going to look like when the baby arrived? You know, that's, that's a really insightful question. And One of the things we talked about before we had the baby was that we were going to try to just be open-minded about adjusting to the roles of parenting and like who was going to do what just because. So like, for example, even though I had the baby, I was not able to chest feed Hudson because I've had top surgery and that's not something many folks who have had that can do. Plus, For a lot of reasons, I was just like, we'll just give the baby formula. Turns out he's really smart and also super huge. So (laughs) this is good. This is for anyone who is feeling stressed about formula. It's great. For anybody who is feeling stressed about formula, um, you know, it sucks to have to depend on it. Like I being in the position where you're deciding how are you going to feed your kid? Once they come, knowing that I wasn't going to be able to do it, it was, you know, we went back and forth about that a lot too. And donor milk, and it was like a whole, it was a whole thing. But formula was not in short supply at that time. And so we were able to formula feed him. 
But regardless, because that was what we were doing, I think formula feeding or at least not chest feeding directly, even if that's what you're doing, allows either parent to really help out equally during that time after the baby is born. When I see my friends who are able to feed the baby themselves with their bodies, they often choose to just do it directly because it's a lot easier than pumping and bottling and all of that, which is what you would have to do to free yourself from having to do that. But I've seen because of the connection between the feeding partner and the baby, it makes the labor necessarily stilted in a lot of ways that I think Malik and I were really free of. So what we tried to do was not make any assumptions about who was going to naturally be better at what kind of role or whatever. We just let our natural sort of, you know, you just figure out a rhythm. I think it's just like any other partnership you have where like some people really like vacuuming and other people are good at the dishes you know if your partner doesn't like doing the dishes but they love vacuuming like let them do the vacuuming and you do the dishes it's not about doing every single task 50 50 it's more about figuring out what are the things that you are okay with doing what are the things you are okay with doing and where can we (laughs) where can we assign things accordingly and yeah, if assign things, things in. Hate, then yeah. those are the things you split. Yep, you split those, or if you can take them off the list, that's always yes, my favorite. Really, I'm like, maybe we I'm don't like, have to do that. <laughs> yes, if you're privileged enough to be able to consider hiring or outsourcing some of those things that neither one of you wants to do, it's amazing. Like we're we're blessed enough to be able to have somebody come clean the house on a regular basis and that was such a that was such a game changer we still end up both cleaning various things at random times between when the house cleaners come but at least malik doesn't feel like he's responsible for cleaning the whole house all the time because that's his natural strong suit like that's i keep doing this because he's out there (laughs) that's his um that's his natural inclination is to do all of that labor. So yeah, no, I mean, outsourcing is amazing. If you can't outsource also think about what you could just do less, like lower the bar for yourself too, is something that I've had to do. Like, like we don't have um, someone who can clean our house. So we're, we're doing that right now. And it's like, what level do I need it to be to feel like good about being in my home, but to not feel like I'm constantly cleaning and that's like all I'm doing. So it's also like dividing up things, outsourcing what you can, when you can't outsource, like make it manageable for yourself too. Yes. And, and also about prioritizing, like, Mm -hmm. We're, you know, we're here to talk about, so I've been thinking about the fourth trimester in particular, and I I was thinking about sort of like what my expectation of that time was going to be like versus the reality. And I think the myth around the fourth trimester and what you think about with new parents is like, oh, they're exhausted. Oh, they're like, they don't have the energy to do anything, which is true, but I think it's not because... It's kind of true. It's mostly true. I think it's not because of lack of sleep or because you're tired. I think it's because the constant three hour, like wake, feed, sleep, engage, you know, repeat sort of cycle is incredibly disorienting. I think it's Mm -hmm. like when people have sleep disorders where their circadian rhythm gets off and you're not getting the proper amount of like night and day and this and that it can really throw you off and it can make you a little a little cuckoo at times and I think that new parents suffer from that and when you're living in this it just I remember feeling like there was a lot of fog there (laughs) a lot of fog and a lot of just like I will be here like this is this is where I live now in this fog of sitting on my couch and either like nursing or feeding or trying to get the baby to fall asleep or the baby sleeping on you, which is like lovely and also makes me, is very draining to me. Like a baby yeah, sleeping on my chest. You can't do anything. You, you can't do anything. Yeah. Chill. 
Yeah, as well, especially if you're the kind of person who's naturally inclined to try to, like, when there's downtime, you prioritize being able to do something else. Like, if you're somebody who is used to doing a lot, multitasking, Mm -hmm. like, being proactive, having a lot on your plate, the forced, like, very rudimentary body functions survival functions kind of only mode that you go into can be so incredibly unstimulating mentally that those times when you're forced to just sit and exist because you're like watching the baby or holding the baby or whatever can be so frustrating. I think it's like people don't talk about all of this stuff enough because I think we're you know, in a lot of ways, you want to feel like happy, you have a baby, you should feel you're like, I should feel really blissed out right now. But honestly, all I want to do is like, put the baby down and walk away and like, go wander around Walgreens by myself and not do anything particular, but just not have to do anything. Like, oh my gosh, be able to like, see another human or like, do something, you know, I still remember, so my twins were in the NICU for luckily just a short amount of time, but that like, when you just said that, I had this image of myself, we had, we left after like the 10 o'clock feeding in the NICU, we would go home and then come back in the morning. And I remember we drove by a CVS and I was like, Ted, let me out. And I like went into the CVS and just wandered the aisles and I picked up the randomest assortment. I remember it was like protein bars and like a loofah and like eyelash extensions. I just kind of was, and I was like, here I am in a CVS. Yep. Yep. There's something so magical about those first few moments when you're able to escape the fog for a minute and go do something, especially because like when I had Hudson, we, it was 2020. So we were still Mm -hmm. deep in the pandemic. Like my mom came out right after he was born to help take care of him, but also to help assist with me because I had C-section and we didn't know how my recovery was going to be. And so she was able to come out quickly and then my husband's mom came out a few weeks later and my mom went home um but you know not really being able to see anybody like friends couldn't really come meet the baby we couldn't really go anywhere we couldn't really do anything and so those first few moments when you get to like escape the fog and you're like oh <gasps> there is a world still out here and look, there are people who aren't covered in like formula, like spit up and whatever, wandering around. It's so magical, but also you remember like how I think it's really important and I didn't prioritize this enough and I should have like try to set something for yourself to do as a goal to motivate towards to get out of the fog because remember that once you get out of the fog you feel so much better (laughs) yeah but you're so right like it is really hard to motivate out of that fog because you also are I felt like kind of scared it was like well yes this is a fog and yes I don't really know what's happening but I also do like you know enough what's happened like it's just the routine of like yes. feed, place, sleep. And it was like, it's it safe. feels scary. It's safe, even if it is like a little disor- you're disoriented, but you kind of are in this playbook, I guess. And so it yeah. can be hard to, to break out of it. And I mean, especially if you in 2020, that is incredibly isolating and not the normal, like standard experience of like friends and family kind of cycling through with a new baby. And so that, no, I mean, which is, gives yeah. you, it can be exhausting on its own because you're like entertaining people and you're like talking about the same things over and over again. All of it is always talking about the baby all the time. Mm-hmm. Even, even if you could just set dates for yourself, like I'm going to go to the chiropractor on this date. I'm going to go get a massage. I'm going to like go walk on the treadmill at the gym and try that out again. Like little things that you could set reminders for yourself to like get out and try to do, even if in the moment you have to dismiss them because the moment will allow you to, to go do that thing. Trying to remind yourself like, Hey, let's get out of this 
space, this time, this routine, do it for a minute so that you can get back in. Because otherwise, like, I think you really do feel like you get lost after a while. Mm -hmm. Just like, like, who have you become? What is your function other than to do these like very few things? And that's it on repeat. And did you know you were going to have a C-section going into Hudson's birth or was that was a surprise no it was I wanted to have a c-section because honestly I've had a lot of like I've had a lot of surgeries in my life because of sports injuries and just like various childhood medical problems plus like top surgery like I've done I've done a lot of interacting with surgical situations and so to me the idea of having a c-section as like a procedure seemed way less scary than the idea of just going in and going with whatever was going to happen birth wise because a like so many scary things can happen during the process of birth you have no idea what the outcome is going to be and also there's you know pain there's this that and the other and i was like i would much rather give me some anesthesia like, let's just do it. None of that scared me as much as the birth process did. So from the beginning, my preference was I would rather do a C-section. My doctor convinced me that it was more prudent to try to go not for a C-section to start with, because for various reasons, their her recommendation and the sort of standards, I guess, for medical practice at the moment is to encourage trying not to have one first. So I was like, okay, whatever. Fine, I will try it your way. But I wasn't happy about it. And then it turns out my blood pressure went bananas at the end of my pregnancy, and I ended up having to be induced. They were like, you're not going to make it to 40 weeks because your blood pressure is crazy. I made it to 38 and a half weeks, basically. And the doctor said, he's fine. He's big enough. We can, we can do this. So they tried inducing me and it took two and a half days, three days. Mm -hmm. um, and nothing was happening. Nothing was happening. I ended up having an epidural because they were upping the, the meds to try to make the induction happen. And I would be having like full on contractions and the baby was going nowhere. I didn't feel it. I only felt some in the very beginning, but I was like totally <clears throat> unaware of all of that, except I, you know, you lay there when you can't feel your legs for three days, which is really, that, that is incredibly long time. It was not cool. The like having to, you have to sleep on your side. So you like can't feel your legs, but you're supposed to monkey yourself over to the side. And then they would make me sleep with a yoga ball between my legs, laying on my side, not being able to feel my legs. I'm like, you all realize how weird this is, right? <laughs> like yeah. some strange like bed gymnastics you're having me do. But all of it was to try to make this baby come out and he was not coming out. So the doctor finally said, okay, we got to do a C-section. We got to do a C-section. Oh and I was like, listen, this is what I have been telling you all along was that this is how this baby was going to come out. I knew it. And so I had the C-section and it turns out his umbilical cord was only like a foot long. <gasps> and so Whoa. he was literally like coming, I would go into contractions and he would come down. And then as soon as I would be done contracting, he would go, junk. <gasps> No way. Oh my gosh. Wow. He was just. <laughs> and so the doctor would be like, I can feel him. And then there he would go. Can't feel him anymore. So she said he was never going to come out. He never, she said, you could have been laboring for ever. He was never going to come out that way. And if we had tried to pull him out, that would have ripped and it would have like, she said it would have been a nightmare. So it's really good that we decided to go in and get him out this way. And I thought, you know what? I knew it. I knew you it. Knew it. That's what I would... was like. This is yeah. not, the, this is not the vision. Like this is, I can see how this is going to happen. And it does not go down that road over there. His umbilical cord was like crazy thick, like a rope. And I got really sick during my pregnancy. I had sepsis from like a really bad ear infection. And my doctor said that super crazy umbilical cord was the only reason he didn't get sick. 
when I was really sick. Wow. That gives me chills. Yeah. She's like, it's good that it was, it was the way that it was because that protected him when you were super ill. But unfortunately that's also what made your birth process like a little wild. So she said, but the, the likelihood that the, if I ever had another kid, that it would be the same is, is high. And so she said, we will just assume that any future kids will also have a crazy milk cord. And that would be, I was like, this is so wild. Bodies They're are just, so crazy. Bodies are wild. Bodies and are just so like crazy. all the things that can happen. And like, I don't know. I, I mean, my husband, if he wanted to cut it and he was like, uh-uh, no He was like, that's Hell, too no. big. No way. I mean, he would have <gasps> said no anyway, but it was, it was. It was wild. Yeah. She's like, I've only seen that one other time before in my entire practice. It's so (laughs) wild. And like all the different things that can come up and like all these different journeys, it's just like, it's a better for for parenthood though, Mm -hmm. is that you like, don't make any plans. That's what I feel like more people need to be telling like expectant parents and new parents is forget, like don't spend too much energy fantasizing about how it's going to look or how it's going to go where that like, don't get your hopes up about it and don't invest too much energy in it. Be prepared for anything because it will like, if something went exactly the way that you had planned it the whole time, I would be shocked. I think that's such great advice. And I think also, I think to tag on to that, I feel like babies come out as like who they are in this way that I did not realize as a first time, like when I was expecting the first time, they just like are themselves. They have a personality from day one and like you are there to kind of like keep them safe and like guide, I guess. But there's so much more their own people than I was expecting. Yes. I think of, I think of it more as like, I'm your, I'm your like caretaker and your shepherd, Mm -hmm. but I'm not really, I don't know. I don't see my son as an extension of me. There are some times when I see him look a certain way or do a certain thing where I'm like, hmm that reminds me of myself or that reminds me of his other dad, but he certainly is like a hundred percent his own person and has been, he's a very fun combination of things of the two of us, but he is a hundred percent his own person. He's recently learned the word no. Ooh, how's that going? (laughs) Um, But he's very polite when he says that he goes, no, Oh. No. So it's very soft. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not like a bratty no. So if you ask him, do you want peanut butter? No. Okay. So we're hearing it a lot, which is great because I'm glad that he's like able to express himself more. I'm just glad it's not like a no, no, you know, we're not there yet. Well, that's good. And that actually is probably a good reflection of you and your partner because my littlest is now a year old and she just like yells all the time. And I'm like, this is because our house is too loud and everyone is just always yelling that she as a baby is like, this is how I have to talk. You know, she's not saying words, but she is just like, I will shout very loudly. Yeah. Well, so it's nice that he has like a nice calm. No, it's a reflection of like a nice calm house you have. There. Yeah. He has a nice calm. No, but he also talks a lot and at a decent, he can talk at a decent volume, which I think is a reflection of um, the fact that his main caretaker has been my mother-in-law who like talks. She's very verbal with him. So he talks nonstop. <laughs> yeah. Talks that's awesome. And okay. So you had, a C-section after having to be trying to be induced for three days instead of just, so you had like both the, the fatigue that comes from that plus major abdominal surgery. Yes. And I know you hadn't thought like recovery would be too bad. Was there anything you had like prepared for in advance or anything that kind of surprised you as you were needing to take that time to heal? I think the thing that surprised me was that I didn't realize that even when you do a C-section, there's still so much like, 
there's still so much related to the pregnancy that your body has to process out that I didn't realize that the like, you know, needing pregnancy underwear and the cleanup and the like all of that I didn't realize that all of that was going to be basically exactly the same Mm -hmm. I thought you know silly me but I'm like you got me cut open you pulled the baby out like can't you just get the shock back and like (laughs) you know know it's it's a messy procedure like can't you just get the shock back and get all of that out and then you know and then sew me up and then I'm you know no more pregnancy the end done clean me up with the mechanics rags and we're good to go. Like that's, that's kind of how I thought it was going to go because in most surgeries, like once you're tidied up and everything, you know, you're sort of doing wound care, right. But you're not doing also like all of that other stuff. And then I, you know, you still have to go through all that. And I was like, well, this part kind of blows, like (laughs) this, this is not fun, but you know, I, I had, my expectation was that it was going to be really super terrible. And so when I was able to like get up and walk, you know, pretty soon after surgery and felt pretty good and pretty mobile and pretty capable fairly quickly afterwards. So to me, it didn't feel like I was prepared for so much worse. And I don't, I think part of it is that I have a very, I had a very talented doctor. I think part of it is that I have a very like high threshold for discomfort when it comes to medical stuff. And also part of it is also probably that I used to do a lot of CrossFit. I don't know when she said, she said when she was doing the C-section, I could hear, you know, you're on the other side of the... (laughs) the sheet so you don't have any idea what's going on but I heard her say "Ooh, this is a really strong abdominus as she's like slicing my stomach open so I was like okay well maybe that had a part to do with the recovery too is that my muscle like I had good muscle memory in my core yeah but my I've- recovery was actually like good I was able to walk up and down the stairs in my house the second day we came home That's great. And I bet you that did have an impact because I can say after three pregnancies, like my third pregnancy, I had absolutely no (laughs) abdominal, like it was, and that it was much harder kind of coming back from that than the first time when I like had some semblance of, yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Like I'm nowhere near if I were to get pregnant, you know, again soon and go back through that process. Now I'm nowhere near as strong or as um, flexible or any of the other things as I was when I started the pregnancy journey the first time. Like it would probably be a very different story this time. Yeah. Well, and so I guess, you know, if you're an expecting parent, look into some pregnancy yoga do whatever you can to help keep your body strong while you're going through the pregnancy, because it will help you be able to bounce back out of the fog, you know, better on the other side. I know I'm learning so much now through this podcast process about like pelvic floor, physical therapy, and all these exercises and all these amazing programs out there. And I was like, how did I miss all of this? I know. I like, didn't realize that yeah, you have you to know. do that too, even if you're having a C-section. Like you still have oh, to do pelvic floor therapy, especially if you've been through any part of like induction pre having a C-section, because apparently just carrying a baby to or nearly to term causes enough pelvic separation and whatever that just that alone, even if you don't give birth um, vaginally, that that can still need pelvic floor therapy. I had no idea. I thought since I had a C-section, I would have gotten off and had none of those issues, but nope, nope. Had my first instance when I sneezed the other day and I peed a little bit in my pants. I was like, that sucks. Welcome to the club. (laughs) That sucks. Uh, But there is so much support out there now though. I feel like (laughs) even in the last like six years since the twins were born, like people are, there's so much more out there about, pelvic floor therapy and like rebuilding that strength so at do least your, we're talking do about your it kegels, y'all. yeah it okay so you entered this fourth trimester with your new baby mm-hmm. had you honestly when before I became a parent I really didn't think about 
postpartum all that much. Like I knew it was, I was going to be sleep deprived. Like I didn't even really know about the every three hours thing of like the cycle of feeding and sleeping. Like when, what was that like kind of entering into the fourth trimester for you for the first time? There was a lot I didn't know either. Um, We were lucky to have some friends uh, like, Malik's best friend had recently given birth um, about a year before Huddy was born. And so she was kind of fresh out of that first year of parenting and shared a lot of really helpful advice with us. Um, But yeah, there's a lot you just don't know. I took a, we took a really helpful online series of classes um, that I think prepared us for a lot of the mechanics of having a new baby. Like, here's an effective way to change a diaper. Here's baby CPR. Here's how you put baby down in a swaddle, like here, you know, stuff like that. Um, But no, there's a lot you don't know. And I think the only thing we really knew going into it that came out to be true is the exhausting part. The rest Mm -hmm. of it, I think you just have to kind of go through. The other thing is that the baby changes so much, like, you could have an idea about how you're going to handle the first two weeks and then baby goes through something and the timing changes or the pattern shifts or Mm -hmm. baby's going through a growth spur or a regression or whatever. It's like just when you figure it out, something happens and you have to refigure it out anyway. So for sure. And I think that can be, that can feel kind of overwhelming, but the good side of that is like the hard parts don't last forever. And when you're in that fog, you can feel like, oh my gosh, like the baby isn't eating and now the baby will never eat again. (laughs) But actually like the next bottle could be a great bottle. Yeah. And then, you know, it'll go back and forth. Like, I think that was something I had a lot of, like any sort of perspective is really hard to gain when you're in that moment, especially at the first time. But like, yeah, there's ups, there's good things about things about the ever changing <laughs> nature of, but the good thing is like, nothing is really going to last. Yes. Like the bad yes. things aren't going to last. I had a, a, I have a friend who has a, a younger baby and she and I were talking about sleeping and she was like, Oh, she was kind of stressed out because she felt like her baby wasn't sleeping enough at three months or four months or however old he was. And she said, he might be going through this regression though. I hear the sleep gets worse than blah, blah, blah. And I said, listen, don't spend too much time worrying about is he on or off track with how much he's supposed to be sleeping at any given time. I said, first of all, I think those expectations are kind of aspirational and sort of a fantasy. Like, I don't think there really is a norm at any given time for most babies. I think every baby kind of figures it out on their own and in their own way and comes to the ability to be able to sleep for a long time on their own at different times. And like, don't feel like you're a failure. You're certainly not doing anything wrong. And there will be no pattern because as soon as you figure a pattern out, something else will happen. Like, just go, just go with it. You're doing fine. (laughs) Absolutely. Just go with it. You're doing fine. You're doing fine. And And I think not fighting against it is such good advice. Like just go with it. You're in the moment. If it's like, I, I really thought of it as like, even I would like try to relax my body because I would feel myself like fighting against whatever was going on and like so tense and just taking, trying to take a deep breath and being like relaxing into it. Like we are just in this time together right now. My one-year-old is like waking up between five and six every morning. She used to like sleep until seven, no longer the case. So I'm like, instead of resisting it, I like go up and like we snuggle and it's earlier than I want my day to start, but it's not going to last forever. And so you actually have a lot of control over how you're framing your experience and the stories you're telling yourself about what's going on. And I think that's something that's really helped me a lot in parenthood is like, I can actually decide if this is okay or not, or good or not um, for me. And there, there, I feel like there is like also letting go of the idea of there being like a good and a bad and a Mm -hmm. right and a wrong. Like 
listen, if the kid is fed, if the kid is getting, you know, enough sleep, then when they're getting it or in what increments or how they're doing it is less important. And honestly, I don't think that there is one playbook. Like, should you look for certain milestones or certain things that like developmentally, that's a different question. But I think in terms of the like, oh, you know, at this point, kids are, my kid's supposed to be sleeping this long or supposed to be eating these things or whatever. It's like, shh, just the kid will do it when, when they're ready to, and it's not worth stressing yourself out about. You said something else that really triggered something that I wish I had paid more attention to in the fourth trimester. If I could go back and tell myself I would, is that body awareness that you mentioned about realizing when you're physically feeling tense. That's something that I did more of when I was practicing yoga more and I should remind myself to do more of now is taking those moments to check in and just be like, where are my shoulders right now? Are they up like around my ears or am I relaxed? How am I holding my arms? You know, is my face scrunched up? Just thinking about that because there's a lot of passive time, especially when like you're feeding the baby or the baby is sleeping on you. Like, how are you holding the baby? Are you like this or are you able to actually like, you know, relax and be present? Because I think we forget to do that a lot. And there's a lot of passive sort of tension that we sit with because we don't know how to channel, you know, whatever else we're thinking about. Yeah, that's really, I mean, maybe that's why I found it's so tiring to be holding a baby because I'm sure I was just like, instead of relaxing into like it, I was just death, tensing like up. Yeah. Baby death grip or even just like the act of unnaturally sort of hunching your shoulders up takes a lot of like active sort of shoulder and neck engagement in a way that is like incredibly stressful. That's close to your spinal cord. It's close to your brain. Your neck gets sore. You get headaches. Like there's a lot that can happen. And I think that if we it's very easy to tune out of your own body's cues as somebody who's just given birth as a new parent generally, because you're so focused on the baby and like just getting the baby to thrive that you forget to like check in with yourself. Like when was the last time I ate? Have I taken a shower? When was the last time I went on a walk <laughs> and got some fresh air? Um, do I have clean socks on? are my shoulders like this or am I feeling relaxed? Like those kinds of little things that you can remember to do, I think actually do make a big difference. A huge difference. I mean, getting outside for me is so huge. We talked yeah. about like trying to get moments away from just like that hamster wheel fog. Um, yes. And I know, I mean, for me also, I have postpartum anxiety that really kind of elevates. Yeah. And I, I think you had a similar experience and would yeah. love to hear like how you kind of recognize that in yourself. Like I know for me, I was definitely dealing the first time around with intrusive thoughts, like fear around like what would happen if I fell down the stairs? What would happen if I dropped the baby down the stairs? Like this was just kind of constant and yeah. I'd have language for it. And then I kind of like learned over time. Oh, like that's what was happening. Yep. Like how the brain was trying to process all of yeah. the, everything that was going on, the anxiety. Luckily, I didn't have the intrusive thoughts, but I'm, I'm so glad I did because I, I did not because I have a very active imagination and I'm sure that would have been, that would have been no bueno. I had definitely had postpartum anxiety and also postpartum depression for sure. Um, my so i suffer from anxiety sort of just generally as a condition it's more like sort of not situational as in like in the moment but situational in terms of my life like there have been times when i have been like off and on using medication to help manage my anxiety and because i was pregnant i was off of all of the medication and i also didn't need it my hormone balance and everything felt pretty good mentally while I was pregnant, aside from being exhausted all the time from carrying the child, I felt fine sort of mentally. So I didn't really think to like prepare myself for the eventuality that when I gave birth, 
I may shift into a situation where I felt like I needed medication to manage. And so I wasn't prepared for it. I didn't have a therapist lined up. I didn't have any medication on deck. I didn't have a plan for like what I could or couldn't take. And as a result, even though I was starting to recognize that I was feeling ways that were probably linked to some kind of a chemical issue, I was so in the like anxiety and depression sort of cycle that I couldn't motivate myself to like make an appointment to talk to somebody about how to deal with it. And so I wish that if there's, you know, one thing I could go back and tell them, not one thing, because I've, I've mentioned a few things now. These are all, yeah, it's all I could recommend, you know, to f- other folks. And then I will certainly keep in mind for myself in the future, if I do choose to carry again is, you know, have a plan if you feel like you're the kind of person who either may go into this or you have a history of this, have a plan on deck with your OB, get a therapist, like line up some sort of a a plan of action um, and get your partner involved too. So that if, and when you're in a postpartum situation, or if you're single and you don't have a partner, a good friend, who you can tell your plan to, who can help hold you accountable to check in like, hey, how are you feeling? Do we need to call the therapist? Do we need to fill that prescription? Do we need to, you know, let them know you're going to start taking these or whatever? You need to come up with something because that will help you immensely. So that as soon as you notice you're having those feelings where you're like, why am I always thinking about dropping the baby? I'm not going to drop the baby. Or why am I feeling like I can't get out of bed, even though that's the only thing I want to do? Like, <clears throat> when you start feeling those things, you can, you know, push the button and roll the plan into action, and you will save yourself like so much, so much. There's no, absolutely no shame in needing some assistance to get back to a feeling of sort of normalcy with respect to your brain chemistry. Pregnancy is a wild thing and bodies are weird and don't always respond the way we want them to. And there's no reason to just suffer through it. Like it's hard enough. I wish I had gone on. I had a meltdown before I finally went on meds. And then as soon as I went on them, I started feeling like, okay, now I at least know I'm not going to have a meltdown. Yeah. So that was that what it was or did your partner recognize it in you or you just, you had to get to that breakdown point? No, I had a breakdown over something that I don't even remember what it was. It was some kind of thing that in the moment felt like the end of the world, apparently, (laughs) but it was like inconsequential in the grand scheme of things. And I just got like really emotional about it and then started basically just started like crying. And then I couldn't stop. And I was like, why am I so there's like a lot happening right now. And my husband was just reminded me gently that there was nothing wrong that I was feeling that way, but that maybe I should talk to, <laughs> talk to somebody about the fact that I was like having this overwhelming sense of like, I, like I couldn't regulate my own emotion or what was happening to me in that moment. And I talked to my doctor and she was like, yeah, well, sounds like this and this and let's just, you know, do, do, do. and then it was fine. <laughs> fine. You know, I think this is so, it's like, if you're listening to this and you're like, and you're preparing for the fourth trimester, or you're in it and this is resonating, like we've talked about things that like you can't control, like you can't control what your baby's going to, their personality, if they're going to eat well, sleep well, you can't control the other people in your life, but something you can plan for is your own mental health and whether you have a history of, you know, any challenges or it's very, as we've said, like this is a wild ride hormonally. You're in this whole sleep deprivation stage, like might as well plan that you might need some extra help and line that up when you're like pregnant or, you know, thinking about the baby arriving. So you're not having to do it in the moment. Like if you're going to make some freezer meals, if you're going to like get diapers and onesies, if you're doing this other prep, like plan for your mental health at the same time. Mental health checklist, hundred percent. And I think also don't discount how much where you live 
what the weather is like seasonally and also just time of year, like holidays are really big and stressful. My son was born right before Halloween. So we were going into Thanksgiving and Christmas, which are two very stressful like taxing holidays. I didn't really take any of that into account either about how all of that was going to weigh on me. And so just try to zoom out and think about like, what are all the areas exactly where you can control and plan for the things you know that are going to happen. All of that also goes into that checklist. Yeah. I hadn't thought about time of year. We just did the, uh, uh, when we signed on today, we're talking about how it's lovely weather where I am. And that totally changed my mood like that. If you think about a normal year, like when do you feel your best? When are you most stressed? And like think about how the baby is going to fit into that and exacerbate that. Yeah. Um, And if you have seasonal affective disorder, seasonal depression, anything like that, and you give birth in the fall, like I did, you know, just think about how much that might be amplified by the pregnancy experience and, you know, just plan accordingly. It's, it is, it is not just for yourself, but it is also an act of trying to put yourself in the position to be the best parent you can. Mm -hmm. And so if, even if you can't think about prioritizing it for yourself, think about taking care of yourself as a, as a machine to help take care of your baby. Yeah, that's, I, I think that can be a really good entryway into giving yourself permission to take care of yourself is like, okay, I'm going to fill my own cup so I can be the best partner, the best parent, the best everything. And then like the goal, and I say this to myself too, is like, you also want to be giving yourself permission that just like, as a person, you deserve that too. But like, that's the way in, I think for me and for a lot of people is like, first you have think of yourself in relation to others. And then you get to the point where you're like, no, I deserve to feel good, like for myself too. Yes. That's the little bit of extra time. Like the extra icing on the cake is don't feel guilty about also needing some self-care as a human. You're allowed to being a parent doesn't automatically turn you into this like selfless machine that lets you surpass all of your own self-care needs. Um, I think that there's kind of a common mythology that that's the way a parent should operate. And I think that that myth only serves to um, wear us down as parents and perpetuate the other myth, which is that parenting has to be exhausting and it has to be selfless and it has to be you know, 100% focused on meeting the kids' needs all the time. Like, does it have to be that? Yes, but it also has to be about yourself. It can't be like there are moments when it's okay to prioritize yourself. And I think that we don't talk about that enough either. That's really good advice. Um, Is there anything else? We kind of talked a lot of great things to keep in mind to remind yourself, like with the things you wish you knew. Is there anything else like thinking back on that fourth trimester that you wish you knew or is as you're, it sounds like you're thinking about maybe another baby, like what you would be, what you'll tell yourself as you, as you go in again. I mean, one of the things that there were a couple of things that I wish that I knew, like just very practically speaking that are on my list of tips to give all new parents. So these are just very nuts and bolts, but I think they were game changers. One is that if you're planning on giving birth or having a baby, bring your own like depends or some other kind of um, leak control underwear, incontinence underwear with you to the hospital and use those because the the undies they give you at the hospital for afterbirth are garbage. <laughs> they are they're garbage. So... They are terrible. They don't fit well. They don't look good. They're not that functional, and it's a mess. Like just bring your own depends. They'll save. They will save your life. Um, you don't need to buy those fancy pregnancy panties. They're not worth it. Good old depends will do, and they're not super gendered looking. So if you're a non-binary or masculine birthing person like myself. Um, It doesn't feel like you're wearing like something super feminine, which is nice. Um, Another thing is invest in multiple sizes of diapers to have on hand when you bring baby home, because you never know exactly how big baby is going to be. 
or just because they weigh a certain amount, like they may be like my son and have the world's skinniest little chicken legs. He had to wear preemie diapers because the regular ones didn't fit around his little skinny legs, even though he wasn't a preemie size. Um, And so we didn't have any on hand and had to go to the hospital kind of in the middle or had to go to the drugstore on the way home from the hospital (laughs) to get him diapers because we didn't plan on having any preemie. Like we didn't think we might possibly need them. And then once the kid starts growing, you never know when you're going to reach for a diaper and put it on and it's suddenly not going to fit anymore. I swear it can happen suddenly like overnight. And so it's Mm -hmm. nice to have some extras on hand of the next size up so that you are always prepared. (laughs) That's really smart. Also at the beginning, I just feel like just really, there's just always blowouts. And so if you wanted to like, if you had a couple different sizes, you could be like, all right, I'm going to try this now or whatever. Um, And you don't need to buy like tons of each because they're going to outgrow it so fast, but just yes. like a little having some different sizes on him. That yes. was another the thing. Buying in bulk is more cost effective, but don't go cray cray and buy like, because you know, you won't be in one size for too long. So it's a little hard to figure out your kid's rhythm in terms of how much they're using. But I think it's always good to keep a variety on hand because you will always need them. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it was so great to chat with you. Um, And I would love before we go, if you could just tell people where to find you. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, It's always like we've had several good conversations now and I'm always uh, game to come back and talk about more stuff. Uh, People can find me on primarily on Instagram. My handle is Bennett on purpose, all one word. Um, I'm also at Hudson's Dads. That's where you can find more content specific to me and my husband and our little one, Huddy. And uh, I also have a streetwear brand. If you want to check it out, it's Transist Shop, T-R-A-N-S-I-S-T, TransistShop.com. Lots of cool stuff, including what I'm wearing right now. So if we ever get to see the video version of this, um, you'll be able to see. But anyway, go check it out. Let's do it again sometime. Great. Thank you so much. Would love that. Take care. Our producer is Zach Walker. Our music is by Sound Planet. And I'm Christy. From me and the entire Kalugo team, thanks for coming on this adventure. We'll be back next week. And until then, remember, you got this.